Uh, good morning. Uh, today we are going to talk to Dr. Kevin Chow, a senior lecturer and researcher in the Department of Hebrew. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you for having me. Uh, doctor, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Yes, yes. So, uh, in the United States where I was trained, uh, the education system is a little different. And uh, in my undergraduate, I was a science major and I studied biology and chemistry. And during that time, I realized I wanted to be a minister. And in the United States, you uh, go straight into a Master of Divinity after uh, your bachelor's. So uh, here in South Africa, we do a Bachelor of Divinity and then a Master of Divinity. But uh, there, there's no Bachelor of Divinity. So when I went to my Master of Divinity to train to be a, a pastor, I realized that I would uh, be much more helpful to the church by being an academic, by being a teacher and a researcher. And I realized that I was very good at languages. And in my undergraduate, all I did was science. So I didn't have a lot of exposure to uh, languages. And I realized I really enjoyed researching and learning about the Hebrew Bible. So I, uh, uh, for my master's, I went to a PhD program rather than going into a church to be a pastor. Okay, thanks a lot, Doctor. And then, what are you currently working on? Uh, I just finished an article that looked at how we understand metaphor in Biblical Hebrew uh, poetry. And metaphor is a huge topic in our field, and um, metaphor and poetry go together. And one of the really good ways of analyzing metaphor is the cognitive linguistic approach. And uh, this article uh, is for biblical scholars, and what we're trying to do is give an overview of the cognitive linguistic theory for how to understand metaphor. And for uh, many biblical scholars, they're not familiar with this field, but it's so helpful for understanding metaphor. So what I did was I did a survey of how the cognitive linguistics um, informs us of uh, metaphor, and then to show how those theories can be applied to interpretation and understanding and formation of metaphor in Biblical Hebrew. So uh, it, it was very cognitive linguistic heavy, but uh, I'd like to think that the application was very clear for showing how that theory works out in um, understanding and interpreting metaphor in Biblical Hebrew, uh, because the problem is many people say, well, it's a metaphor, and metaphor can mean anything. Well, in the cognitive linguistic approach, we have clear principles that say, well, it can't mean everything. Uh, it narrows it down, and, it, and it, um, the theory helps guide us to say, well, these are the certain ways we can interpret metaphor, and these are certain ways we cannot, and this is how metaphor works. This is how it does not work, and that guides our interpretation. Thank you so much, Doctor. So in relation to what you have just said, is there any specific example that you can give us showing us the metaphor that plays a role in a poetry? Uh, yes. Um, um, I'm sorry, just give me a second. Uh, yes. So, uh, there's this one section in Jeremiah where it says uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and he is going to uh, pick out the people from the land, like how you pick out yes. ticks uh, from your body. And then uh, there's another interpretation of the metaphor as how King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and he's going to roll up the land like how a shepherd rolls up uh, his pack and then go away and take away all the goods from the country and uh, The way that metaphor works is because we're not sure about whether the verb means to take out pit, uh, ticks or to roll up a mat like a shepherd and uh, I argued that if you're picking out ticks, right? You pick out ticks and you throw them away You don't want to keep them and if that's a metaphor for taking stuff from the land like plundering their goods their animals it doesn't make sense. We take animals, we take goods uh, in uh, biblical uh, 
I'm sorry, so in, uh, when they come to invade, they take goods and they keep them. But when we take out ticks, we don't keep them. <laughs> we throw them away. Yes. So that's part of the cognitive linguistic approach where there's a logical consistency, um, and that helps show how that metaphor doesn't work if we translate a verb uh, as taking out ticks. So. Thank you so much for enlightening us, Doctor. And then, are there any exciting gaps within your field? Yes, so uh, I work in biblical poetry and uh, metaphor, and um, what I do is I have a foot in two worlds, in the linguistic world and in literary approaches to uh, poetry. And the problem is oftentimes this group of people do not talk to this group of people, and my job is to help bridge the gap. And oftentimes in the literary approaches, the um, bringing over linguistic models and theories is very helpful for refining the method and execution of that literary theory. So I see myself as a bridge type of scholar between uh, the two camps. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then coming to your work, your writing, is there a specific philosophy or school of thought that influenced your writing? So, uh, one major uh, aspect that influences my research and writing is that poetry oftentimes is thought of as a literary, um, uh, a study of literary literature. Well, poetry can also be analyzed linguistically. And in Biblical Hebrew poetry, the parallelism is actually expressed in different linguistic levels. So the sound level, the shape of the word, morphology level, the syntax level, which is uh, how the words are put together and in relationship and word order, and then there's semantics, the meaning. And oftentimes the literary people just work on the semantic level, but uh, poetry works on all these different levels and having a uh, nuanced understanding of linguistics allows us to have a much more richer understanding of poetry. Thank you so much, Doctor. Then coming back to the Biblical Hebrew, are there any verbs in Biblical Hebrew? Yes, yes. So uh, Biblical Hebrew, as opposed to English, um, the verbs are different in the sense that in English, we always have to use a subject. I see, you see, he sees. Um, and in Biblical Hebrew, the verb carries the subject. So it's inflected for a subject. So you can just say the verb, and it includes the subject. So if I say katavti, it means I wrote. And then if I say katavnu, we wrote. So uh, yes, we have verbs, but they, unlike English, it carries the subject. Okay. Yes. No, thank you so much, Doc. And then, what message can you give to aspiring researchers? Um, the message I would give is that oftentimes uh, young researchers feel that they need to read everything. And in a certain sense, that's true. You have to uh, be aware of your field. But many researchers, what they do is they spread themselves too thin and they try to read everything. Well, I, I think we have to be aware of everything. But the most important thing is you have to read very, very deeply and to have a very deep knowledge of, of the most important things uh, for your method, uh, for your theories, and for your field. And from that, it informs all your other uh, readings. So it's, uh, it's being wise in our investment of our time and reading deeply into certain areas that have a lot of value rather than just reading indiscriminately. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. And then going back in where one starts to understand the Biblical Hebrew, can we apply the African perspective so that one can be able to understand the Biblical Hebrew? Yes, yeah, so in Biblical Hebrew poetry, uh, it's obviously written because it's in our Hebrew Bible. And poetry um, in Biblical Hebrew is very special and unique in that it came from an oral setting. And even when it was written down, 
it was written down to be performed and to be spoken and to be spoken uh, for someone for themselves or to other people. And it had this um, orality um, and it had this sense of performance. And I think from our African culture here that is uh, very much, uh, an, um, that has a very heavy oral culture as well, bringing that uh, African oral perspective onto the Bible and seeing that we can recover elements that have been lost because many Westerners do not come from an oral culture. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then, apart from research, what are your other interests? Uh, so, apart from my research interests, well, I, I really enjoy fishing. Okay. So, uh, I enjoy fly fishing, and I haven't had a chance to fly fish in South Africa, but uh, I tie my own flies, and um, I enjoy fly fishing. So. Wow. Thank you so much, Doctor, for sharing with us. We really appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you for having me. It was a privilege to be here. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.